Uh, the airship is 196 feet long, 67 feet high from the, from the ground to the top of the fin, and weighs about 7,000 pounds without the helium. Just now it weighs about 40 kilos. I am authorized to read this message. You have spotted the Pink Floyd airship. Do not be alarmed. Pink Floyd have sent their airship to North America to deliver a message. The Pink Floyd airship is headed towards a destination where all will be explained upon arrival. Pink Floyd will communicate. quite a massive production. We've been working on it since January 93 and uh, there are currently 
two giant freighters on the Atlantic Ocean heading for North America. Uh, and there's 56 tractor trailers going to be meeting those ships and moving the equipment actually to a secret location in California where we're doing all our production rehearsals. Our major problem was finding a rehearsal facility that was both secure and large enough to be able to work on this production. And the US Air Force have come to our rescue. So I want to say thank you to the US Air Force. We've got a military establishment and they've given us one of the biggest hangars in the world to actually rehearse in. They're clearing out airplanes out of it right now and we're going to be rehearsing there, but I'm not allowed to say where it is. <laughs> My name is Mark Brickman and I was the uh, production designer for the uh, Pink Floyd Division Bell Tour. My name is Mark Fisher and I was the designer of the Division Bell Tour. I think that what we tried to accomplish in the beginning was to uh, create a, um, an environment in the stadium that would um, accentuate the music that Pink Floyd plays and, and create an atmosphere that would really encompass the whole stadium. And that was really the goal, to make them larger than life. And I think the first meeting was probably with Mark Brickman. And at that point, he'd already had meetings with the band. He came to me with a, an idea to create an arch at the end of the stadium, an arch which was to be a kind of entrance tunnel to another world, so that the whole thing of the band playing in this entrance was really the big idea for how the show was going to be. And so we started talking then about how it might be done. The process starts with the band and starts with their music, starts with meetings about you know what, what they have in their mind and what they'd like to accomplish. Um, and the process then goes into uh, drawings, models. Um, we then move into construction, rehearsals, and then we go on tour. Designing a, a set like Division Bell goes through really four stages, I guess. The big idea, the design, the art design, the um, construction, and then the figuring out how to tour it with the touring crew. The first stage is, <clears throat> from the band's point of view, and ultimately the public's, the most important. That's the idea. What is the big idea from which everything else is derived? As I recall, it, it got settled down pretty quickly to this big arch with a smaller roof inside underneath and then the two 
PA towers, which eventually had the pigs in at the top, off to the sides, and the whole thing being about 200 feet wide, and the arch itself being somewhere in the region of 120 feet wide and 80 feet high. My name's Robbie Williams, and I'm the production director for the Pink Floyd Division Bell Tour. The production director's role is really to take the tour from its sort of initial inception with from through the design stage talking to the designers and the musicians about exactly what they want to do checking out which venues we're proposing to play and making sure that the show that gets designed can a fit into the various venues um obviously also fill them give the fans the scale of performance that you know they've grown to expect with pink floyd but also to make sure that it can be put up performed on and dismantled and moved to the next city in time. It then goes into the more detailed, OK, this is where the engineers come in and we work out exactly how we're going to build it. This is where the people who will do production drawings for cutting steel, for making things, come in. And it goes into a building stage, which involves an ever-increasing number of people. So the idea is that the equipment that takes the longest to set up, which is the staging and the stadium preparation, you have two or three sets of that which can leapfrog around each other. So at any one time there will be one stage being built in one city, one being performed upon in another city, and then in the last city you were in there will be one being dismantled, ready to be moved on. And then just one set of the sort of band equipment, the sound and lights, which does actually go to every show. If you were standing on the stage as a member of the band in front of you, out in the house you had the mixed position, which was a wonderful Baroque structure. It had sliding roofs on it. It had a level for the, for the PA mixing. It had a level for the band guests with its own terrace and, of course, a bar downstairs with wet bar with refrigerators. Behind you, over your head, you had a roofette which had these fingers which had lights on. Further behind you on the floor was the big circular screen with lights all around it and explosives mounted for the moment at the end of the show when the whole screen blew up. Each of the three staging teams was probably 12 people and would be supplemented with an army of local helpers and scaffolders and riggers, which would probably be sort of 50 or 60 people. And then when the main team had arrived, which would be about another 100 people, once again they'd be supplemented by another army of local helpers. We then have a sound crew various lighting crews that come from the various companies that supply the different lighting elements, the pyrotechnics crew, um, specialist carpenters and engineers that operate things like the mirror ball and the actual building of the performance stage. Um, we have a team of site coordinators who always travel ahead of everybody else and make sure that each city is ready so that when the staging trucks roll in, we're ready to you know, use them and all the various local infrastructure that we need has to be in place. My approach to lighting design always has been to dramatically try to um, tell the story in lighting you know, by, by, by using darkness as a base. So the, the lighting design is always about, um, about accentuating the music and people can follow you know, the instruments that are playing and what's going on and visually painting with light. The main lights that we used in the show were um, of two kinds. There were lights that came from Very Light, which is based in Dallas, and lights that came from Telescan, which is a French company. The Telescan lights were mostly lights of a kind that have moving mirrors. You have a light a lump of light and it sends a beam out one end and has a mirror that can be moved. They typically produce a very tight, bright beam, and the object is unusual relatively speaking, because the light comes out at a right angle to the main direction of the object. So you're always trying to kind of push it up against things. Right, the lighting design in included uh, uh, telescans, which is a French-based light. We had uh, telescan projectors, which we had five of those, which were a very high-end still film projector that had scrollers that allowed images to go scrolling across the front of the stage. It also, we incorporated one of those projectors as an oil based liquid light show from throwback to the 60s. We also had um, numerous very lights, probably I think in, in Earl's Court there was probably uh, I think around 150 very lights. Um, we also had uh, some specially made um, 
the dialects, um, uh, Dave's request, <laughs> which were these 2500 watt HMI high speed color wheels that Dave used to uh, stare into um, during the performance when he was playing guitar solos. They were very incredibly bright and they looked big color wheels really. Um, uh, that, was, that was his creation. At the front of the stage, just below the band's feet, and running across the whole of the front of the arch were a series of um, units, each containing periactoi, which are most often found in advertising hoardings, where you see these advertising hoardings made up of triangular prisms, which can flip round, so they have three faces. We had a black face, which is what the audience saw when they first came in, a mirror face, which was there when we wanted to use it to dazzle the audience with reflected light, and also a third face, which had taken over all of the panels together, over a thousand individual channels of spotlights, PAR-56 spotlights, with very narrow beams, which we could program so that we could make a matrix of moving lights, we could make words that would run across like a giant telecaster board, we could make all kinds of patterns. And so these things could roll, they were rigged horizontally, they could roll around, and at the climax of the show they spin continuously, and you see that really clearly in the video, with the light beams bursting out over the audience as they re revolve. We also had the front of the stage had a thousand par 46 lights that spun and, uh, and then run like hell well, that was always one of the best cues when they would start spinning and it looked like the world was coming to an end um uh the, the last obviously at the end of run like hell every every it was the you know, the parody of, of the rock show and, and we definitely hit that <laughs> that number in that and so those lights that that whole scene always was was pretty stunning, but look, I keyed all the musicians um, with telescanned lights so that everybody had a key light, so that really they all popped out as a unit. They were always visible. People could always see who was playing. Obviously, David had follow spots, um, and uh, you know, and the singers whenever they did their backups, we used some follow spots. But the main the main lighting was really these telescanned lights to key everybody, so that inside the picture, inside the frame you literally could paint with light and, and follow the music, and not in a flashing way, but in a much more dramatic way, where you really were molding and, and, and cross-fading color, so that you, you, as long as they stayed constant, the musicians stayed constant in the key light, um, all the effects around them could happen. <clears throat> with the Floyd, the, the position of the, bands on, the, the members of the band on stage is very important, and I worked with Phil Taylor to figure that out. They were in rehearsal and I was going down and measuring things with Phil, going to the warehouse where the equipment was stored. And we worked the whole thing out in, in great detail, mainly because we wanted to try and keep the band very compact. And it's not the kind of band where people are running around. And what we wanted to do was really get them as close to the audience as we could. Uh, I'm Phil Taylor. My job on the tour was the Pink Floyd's backline crew chief which more specifically means that I look after and, and responsible for the band's equipment on stage and even more specifically David Gilmore's guitars and his equipment. His main working guitar for most of the songs where he's playing electric guitar is a red 57 vintage reissue Stratocaster which is uh, been fitted with EMG pickups and an SPC and EXG tone controls. That's his main workhorse that he uses for a lot of the stuff. In addition to that, he has a couple of uh, 52 Telecasters uh, with a slight different tuning, one which he uses for Astronomy Domini and one with the bottom string tuned down to D which he uses for Run Like Hell. Also, uh, there are a couple of uh, lap steel guitars, again with different tunings, which I used, for example, on One of These Days and High Hopes. I'm Andy Jackson. I was sound engineer on the Pulse Tour. My job is to take feeds of all the signals from all the instruments on stage and so on and bring them together into a mixing console from where I can control the sound colours there, control the levels and bring it all together into the sound picture that you hear. Um, I have to mention Colin Norfield and Dave Law who worked with me on that. Um, doing different aspects of the sound and as a team we made what you heard that night. Um, Pink Floyd have always 
spent a lot of time and money making sure that the sound system they use is you know the finest um, and there's a, there are basically two sound systems that we use. One is a basic stereo PA system, which is in the conventional positions either side of the stage. This was one of the first big tours out for the Turbo Sound flashlight system, which was a great help to us. It's a very good system. It was a huge jump forward from anything that had been around before. In some ways, it sounds like a big, big hi-fi. It doesn't behave like a big hi-fi, but it has that kind of quality. You don't feel like you're fighting against the PA. It feels like it's very, very clean, and very, very neutral. One of the principles, as best I understand it, is that essentially, wherever you are in the hall, you're listening to one speaker cabinet, not a whole bunch of them, so they behave very well. You always get a very even sound around the hall, and it certainly was a great help to us. It was a very nice system to work on. Uh, and then they also have a quad what they call a quad sound system, which is actually three further stacks of speakers, one which is in the middle at the back behind the audience, and then there's a further stack on either side of the audience. Which actually in some ways is a much more intuitive way of thinking about it. You think of things as being in front of you or behind you or to the left or to the right, and we could take any particular source and feed it into a joystick, which would allow us to actually position that sound anywhere or even have it fly around the room as we pleased, which was always great fun. Which enables them to pan s guitar solos and the like around the audience and also to feed the sound effects. So if you've got a running man sound effect or water running, it can be, you know, all the way around the outside of the audience, giving a far more sort of spatial effect. David, on a track called Keep Talking, used a unit uh, well, made by Heil uh, called a voice box which consists of a polythene tube which is run up the mic stand and positioned next to the microphone and actually then place it in their mouth. So the guitar sound goes to an amplifier into the voice box itself, up the tube into their mouth and then by manipulating their mouth the guitar sound comes from that and into the vocal microphone. We mixed the show on Yamaha boards. Colin had the drums and bass, I had all the top line instruments, Dave had splits from some of those things and all the tapes and stuff for the quads. I, th I think the important thing really is, is to try and keep it simple and concentrate on the important things and the important thing is the balance, can you hear the guy you're supposed to be hearing at that particular time, you know, if it's, if the guy's singing you want to hear that, if, it, if it's a solo you want to hear that, that's what's important at that time, just keep it simple. Rick's keyboard rig is what you would call pretty basic in that he played mainly Hammond organ, grand piano and some synth stuff. John's setup was a much more complex affair with a sequencer and various sound modules that enabled him to create sound washes and atmospherics and play other specific parts. Guy's bass setup, um, first of all he used four different guitars, a precision bass, a jazz bass, both made by Fender, a status bass and which was a five string and a spectre. Um, these would be plugged into a Trace Elliott preamp which had different presets on for the different levels and different EQ settings of each bass to enable his on-stage sound to remain constant. Nick and Gary both used drum workshop kits. The original idea was that they sat on one riser and looked like one big drum kit with two people playing it, so they were ordered in the same colour to facilitate that. However, the reality when we got it on stage was that it looked like two drum kits. We used some very state-of-the-art laser equipment that came through Oxford Lasers in England. Copper Vapour was the title of them, which gave a much broader beam. And we've all seen lasers in many shows before, which are usually traditionally sort of green or blue or red. Um, these particular lasers gave a particularly wide and incredibly bright sort of orange beam. Very high powered lasers, lasers that really have only been used with this tour and they were used to split isotopes. It was the main purpose in life, so they came from the military. Every evening we'd have to get clearance from the FAA when we played in America so that we didn't um, get in the flight path of, of uh, oncoming, incoming planes at some of the airports when we, when we played the stadiums. I love the lasers just because of how beautiful the gold color was. I, I think the lasers really using them in an architectural way, in a manner where right, we define space, were just very powerful. Uh, the, cir the circular screen was uh, 42 feet wide. It was a 70 millimeter projector behind the, uh, the inflated back wall. 
and um, and it was used for uh, for projection of the films. It's Storm Thurgerson that made. Uh, my name is Storm Storm Thurgerson, and I am the director of the Screen Films. The, the, the Floyd Circular Screen, which is usually uh, in the middle of the stage, and, uh, easy for most people to see, um, is in part a specific Floyd thing that I think they did first. Also, it, um, I think, allows for different kind of composition. So from the directorial end, it's quite interesting um, to work for a circular screen. And actually what we do is we put a little circular mask inside the viewer on the camera, right? Whether it's a, whether we're shooting in tape or in film, so that what we see is what we're going to project. Moving the circular projection screen was technically quite complicated because it was very big, and we had to arrange it so that we could open up the back wall of the arch at the moment that the screen was lifted, so that it could tip forward and get itself into a vertical position. But once we'd worked out how to do it, when it was done each night in the show, it was pretty smooth because the whole point of a show like this is that in technical rehearsals you, you work these things out. So by the time it goes on the road, they're reasonably debugged. In terms of the projection, the projector is a 70 mm um, projector with 70 mm films, spools, and they're huge, okay? Uh, it's the best quality you can get, uh, other than IMAX, which they were thinking of doing. Um, but that was actually <laughs> prohibitive. If you think of how big an IMAX screen is, you would never have seen the musicians. Um, the props that we used on that on the Division Bell tour, we had the aeroplane, which has been used over in Pink Floyd shows over many years, and virtually all the tours since um, Dark Side of the Moon. We used two pig heads above the PA system on either side of the stage. They were deployed during one of these days. In the house, we had this uh, mirror ball that was on the top of a tower that zipped itself together and went up 60 feet. And we had a mirror ball on the top of it, which was 20 feet in diameter, which squashed down flat like a pancake and lifted up into a sphere as it went up. And then it opened up like a giant flower petal with a very bright light inside it. And it was a really religious moment when this thing happened towards the end of the show, right in the middle of the stadium, quite extraordinary, went up really high and lit up the whole stadium. That was a great, great thing. Obviously the question of sync is, is quite a complex issue, because if you're a musician you can imagine that maybe you just want to play according to your mood. Maybe you want to play, you know, slower or faster for a variety of reasons, and nothing to do with the film itself. And sometimes you may want to play to the film. Many, many people have asked how we kept everything in sync in the show, the various films and sound effects and things like that. And the answer is, we didn't, really. We did it all by hand. Um, there'd be times when Dave Law would be on headphones and he'd just be waiting for a particular musical point and he'd lined his tape machine up on a mark and he'd press the button and lo and behold, it would come out at the right time. On Shine On Your Crazy Diamond, David Gilmore would watch the film and just start playing at a particular time. And he'd have a couple of particular cue points he knew, and if he was in front of it, he'd slow down a bit. If he was behind it, he'd speed up. And it meant that, basically, he could keep the whole song in sync with the film. Near enough, it might drift out by a second here or there, but it didn't matter. You were still seeing the picture that applied to the line you were hearing him sing. The film is made of mixes rather than cuts. So it's a slow procedure changing gradually from one shot to another, often in slow motion. And that was a, a very distinct decision, not only to be resonant with the music, but also it meant that there weren't any particular cut points. You know, a, a mix is soft. And if you're in slow motion and the mix is soft, then you've got no hard times to go by. Although on the run, for example, would be fixed. And also at the beginning of time, I think it's fixed, you have to have a click track. But uh, the whole business is such a number, <laughs> you know, it's extraordinary. What's more interesting in the process is what were the films trying to do, if you like? What are the implications, which are different from other situations, partially because you're making films to accompany the um, live show, but also they're telling stories that are Floyd stories. Sometimes the stories are, are not very clear, so or more um, loose, more poetic, if you like for want of a better word, though well, that's a pretty good word. Um, in terms of specific films, 
Shine On is um, very personal because it's an attempt in part to represent Sid and sort of refer to his uh, abbreviated life story. I mean, it's not real, nor is it direct, it's just metaphorical, but it's um, very personal to me and to the band um, in trying to say something oblique and a bit sad, really, for Sid. Higher Hopes is also very personal, but this time to our youth and, and, and to the town we came from, namely Cambridge, and has lots of references in it that are to do with youth and memory, and also to do with uh, the kind of distortion of memory, that, you know, often when you remember your childhood, it's always, always as if things were much bigger and more powerful. And this is twofold. It's partly because I think they are, because they strike you when you're younger, therefore your brain is, your memory is kind of like newer, so what hits you is the first time. But it's also true, because you're a toddler, and in fact, everything from trees to adults are taller, bigger. I mean, for example, one of the guys on stilts, who, who I really enjoyed, not just because of the kind of odd way they walk, but also because they're so tall. And this tallness was just, if you like, uh, a simple way to suggest the memory, that the memory was bigger. And the same goes for the gowns. Remember the guy who was walking along um, the runway at the old aerodrome? And this gown is enormous. I mean, it's about, it's about 60 foot. It's huge. And actually, we had to hold it up by um, air balloons because it was so big. And we painted them out afterwards. On an average day, we would go in with the back line at 10 o'clock. We were the last uh, crew to go in. Our goal was to be ready for four o'clock when the band would turn up for a sound check. The sound check itself was always done in a predetermined order, starting with the drums and percussion and working through the band to David, who was the last person. The band would then play a couple of numbers together, make sure everything was sounding right, turn everything on to standby, go and have some dinner. By the time we got to the European leg of the tour, which were largely outdoor venues, and would tend to open the, open the doors very, very early and let people in a, in the middle of the afternoon, and they, the, the, the public would be in before we arrived. And so, effectively, we couldn't sound check, and we didn't. So, the, pretty well, the European leg of the tour was done without a sound check. And by then, we really knew the show very well, and we could look at the board, put the faders to the right position, and start the first song, and we'd be pretty well right. And by a minute in, we'd be absolutely where we would have been if we'd done a sound check. Some of the best stadiums to play in were the small college towns where you'd play their football stadium and they'd very often be quite low at the sides and have an open back and it was almost the same as playing in a field. And they were lovely to play and they were really very nice controlled sound, not very reverberant, good, to, very good. Some of our best shows were in those small towns. The worst, which is notorious, was the um, uh, Olympic Stadium in Montreal which coincidentally is the famous venue for Roger spitting at the audience that led onto the wall shows. And it is a horrible venue, it's notoriously horrible. It's got reverber, the reverb's probably still going eight years later, it's just horrendous. We found really the only way to play those places was to try and drown it out, which is unfortunate philosophy, was just to go very loud. And it actually seemed to help, which is a shame. We'd rather not have done that. One show that was particularly exciting was in Rice, um, uh, the Rice University Stadium in, in Houston, Texas, where we had a remarkable amount of rain. And we were into the show, and a tropical rainstorm decided to descend on us. And effectively flooded the entire stadium. You can't protect against a tropical rainstorm. It was... It was, you know, an inch in five minutes or something. It was unbelievable. And a car in the car park was struck by lightning and blew up, which was witnessed by a PA crew from the surround sound PA that was up on the edge of the stadium. And I have a photograph that I took as the roof above the stage collapsed and this gigantic amount of water came down onto the stage so much that it just wiped everything off. The audience, amazingly enough, by the end of it, were standing almost up to their knees in water in the stadium. Um, the rain often adds an, a, sort of an extra exciting element to the show and forms a bit of a bond between the audience and the band because everybody's determined still to enjoy themselves and to enjoy the experience. It got to the point where, one by one, various pieces of equipment uh, started going off. People would break down on the stage and, into the end, they were playing as a trio. Were just David and Bass and drums. Nick Mason was left 
plopping his drums in a puddle of water on a snare. Everything else had shut down, gone away. You know, I mean, literally, instruments were going down one by one. The lighting system went down. The sound system went. Everything went down. I mean, it was just blow. The band was soaking wet. Once David's guitar packed up, that was it, and it had to be the end of the show. There was just nothing left that worked. For me, I think the the big memory was actually coming to Earl's Court and having done nearly six months on the road of doing outdoor shows every other day, travelling, dealing with the weather and all that that entails, uh, and also playing to large venues of between, I suppose, 30 and 100,000 people. It was very nice to actually be inside, out of the weather, could go home at night. We were there for three weeks, didn't have to put the equipment away. And uh, it was like playing a small club to us, really, after the shows we'd done. A lot of people worry about going in and playing Earl's Court because it's regarded as being a difficult venue for the acoustics. I have to say, for us, compared to where we'd been for the last six months, it was relatively easy. I mean, it's difficult because it's big and it's reverberant, but actually it's smaller and less reverberant than a lot of the places we'd done. So it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't really that difficult or that intimidating. Britannia Row had also got a lot of experience at that venue and knew how to rig it to make it work. So, it, you know, for a lot, I suppose for a lot of people, that's where they go into the biggest room they play. For us, it was the smallest room, so different. I think with any group that are touring, when they come back into their home city, it's particularly special. Um, and this, of course, was because they hadn't played in England on the whole tour. Um, they came back at the end of 120 shows around America and Europe or whatever it was. Um, so yes, A, it was a combination of the homecoming, B, it's the sort of the main prestigious venue in London. We were able to break records and sell it out for 14 nights in a row. Um, and so the general sort of excitement and atmosphere surrounding the whole event was particularly special. I think at the last, the last note at Earl's Court, one, of course, automatically, having done the show for six months, goes into auto mode of we've got to pack all this equipment away. But there is a, a bit of a sense of, I suppose, loss or empty feeling at the same time in that you've been doing that every other day for six months and suddenly that's it, it's over. So it's always a little sad at that point, you know, and you've built up relationships and friendships with different people and all the things that go along with that. And it's. Uh, it's inevitably a, a slight sad time, although happy to be home and have a break, because it is pretty gruelling as well. <laughs> to induct Pink Floyd into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. From Smashing Pumpkins, Billy Corgan. Um, hi. I know it's a little late. I'll uh, keep my remarks to the length of an average Pink Floyd song. Um, I'd like to start uh, with some personal reflections. Um, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. I'm roughly uh, 28 years old. And when people would say Pink Floyd, before I even heard a note, there was a certain reverence that surrounded this band. They were a strange anomaly in the 70s filled with this horrible, awful music, which some of you in this room are responsible for. They were a mysterious band. You didn't really know what they looked like most of the time. They had amazing artwork that had pyramids and prisms and crazy things. And the first album I heard was Dark Side of the Moon, which, as we all know, is probably one of the best albums of all time. Uh, I first heard this album in the Wall era, which, to me, at my tender age of 14, was too creepy, too intense, too nihilistic. And, uh, of course, these are all the things I believe in now. Through Dark Side of the Moon, I, I sought out their other albums, and I, and I became a fan. And when I was 17 years old, my, uh, my grandmother was diagnosed with cancer. And it was one of the most painful periods of my life. And the Pink Floyd song, Wish You Were Here, seemed to sum up everything that I was feeling. And when I couldn't take what was going on in my life with her dying, I listened to that song over and over, and it still makes me cry. It's such a beautiful song. And, uh, you know, when you're 17, heaven from hell, blue skies from pain, it means a lot. 
And so this is why I think I'm here at this particular moment to uh, thank them for everything that they've ever done. So when I was asked to do this, I thought, well, you know, I could come out here and go on and on about the mystery and mythology of Pink Floyd, but I thought I'd actually go back and listen to a lot of the records that I had impressions with and had listened to, but go back as, a, as an adult, per se, and um, really kind of delve in to this band. So I started with the first record, and of course, with Pink Floyd, it's always uh, the very root of Pink Floyd surrounds the genesis with Sid Barrett. And as we all know, we're, yes, sir. You know, we're so uh, consistently amazed in rock and roll with tragedy and beauty, and Sid was both. And uh, his, his original artistic vision that's, that's expressed on the first Pink Floyd record really defined what this band still continues to be, uh, an exploration into the outer terrains of whatever it is that makes music happen. I'd just like to spotlight a couple records that really, to me, define what Pink Floyd's all about. After, after Sid went wherever Sid went, um, I listened to some of the records after that, and, and, it, and they really sounded like a band unsure of where to go. And it wasn't until the record that they put out called Metal that suddenly it had that sound, you know, galloping horses and astral planes and echoes and... And it's really on that record that you hear a band fusing and synthesizing something that's never been really recreated. Um, of course, Dark Side of the Moon, the ultimate synthesis of sound and vision and lyrics. The other thing I'd like to point out is the album The Wall, which, as I said, when I was 14 years old, was beyond my conception. But at 28 years old, it's one of the bravest records I've ever heard. And I really can't point to anything else that's ever summed up everything that's fucked up about life, everything that's fucked up about rock. It takes on politics, hero worship, rock and roll, and our desires to connect with the universe all in one fell swoop. It really, truly is an amazing testament to how far they were willing to go to reach the outer limits of what's important. The band Pink Floyd is really bigger than any particular individual. And, uh, we are here tonight inducting as much an institution, if excuse the pun, as the particular members of the band. They've survived everything, and I don't personally know all the politics between them all, but we have the music as a legacy. So I personally, and I hope all of you, will salute the legacy of their bravery, courage, spirit, and ultimately their music. It's a great legacy, and I wish, that, um, I wish them all well. Pink Floyd. <laughs> to grab a couple more of these for our two band members that started playing different tunes, Roger and Sid. We'll take a couple of these home for them. Thank you very much indeed. So you think you can tell Thank you. 
And we did, we did. Thank you very much again. Good night. Thank you very much.